So welcome everyone. My name is Taurus the Legend. Thank you so much for uh, joining us on our episode 10 of the SAP Garage series. Today we're going to be covering create simple connected digital experiences with API based integration mission uh, found on the Discovery Center. Today's uh, presenters will be my colleagues uh, James uh, Rapp, Martin Frick and Kai Schmitterkirk, uh, um, all from the SAP BTP team. Today's um, mission will be create simple connected digital experience with API based integration. So if you do go to the Discovery Center mission, you can definitely find this and, and um, start the mission yourself um, after uh, this, uh, our call today. Um, I'd like to now hand it over to, to James to kick us off. James. Sounds good. Short but sweet, Toros, thank you. Uh, so let's try to share the screen. And if you'll just give me a thumbs up that you can see my content we'll and see. still see my face, then yep. I think yes. I'm good to go. Yep. Beautiful, beautiful. So good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is James Rapp. I hope you'll call me Jim. I'm joining you from Denver, Colorado, where it's just turned 9 a.m. Uh, and I thought I would join you with a virtual background of the Building 7 garage uh, in Palo Alto, where we've shared a lot of good times. All right. Let's get this going. So um, as a starting point, I'll share with you just a couple of slides. And I call this first one, why you should care about this topic. And specifically, why you should care about integration and API management. All right. So um, by way of background, if you were to look up the Gartner Magic Quadrant for Enterprise Integration Platform as a Service, you'd see immediately that SAP is a leader. But you would also see that the leaders group is pretty crowded. Um, and hypothetically, if you were to Google the subject, you'll find lots of write-ups by SAP competitors on the subject highlighting their position. But the point is that a lot of SAP customers have investments in numerous integration products. Many still are using on-premise footprints of SAP's process integration and process orchestration products. And almost all of these folks share a desire to reduce their costs, modernize with cloud, and in the case of PI and PO, get ahead of end of maintenance announcement for their legacy stacks. Now, when I was preparing for the session last night, I noticed that last month's garage session was specifically about a partner app that helps customers automate their migration from process integration to integration suite. So the topic is a very timely one. Now, you may already know that Integration Suite is more than just the SAP cloud integration product. So it also brings API management and open connector capabilities as well. And I probably don't need to tell you, but at the risk of being redundant, utilizing more of these Integration Suite components is a great way to maximize your own investment in the product. Now, API management as a capability is pretty highly commoditized in the market, means that features like providing an API gateway, handling some audit, um, access of APIs, everybody can do it. And as a result, it's very common for companies to have more than one API gateway provider. So think you might be using infrastructure or hyperscaler APIs like blob storage, you might be using business APIs from other SAP business applications or integration APIs. So it's important that we add value, right, to um, acting beyond just a gateway, right? And this is especially important as the need for integration across SAP systems, third-party systems, I'd venture to say line of business applications from different vendors and so on increases. And from my background as an SAP developer, I can put this into context by thinking about our API business hub. Probably a lot of you on the call are familiar with it. And this has a ton of upside for developers. So it brings things like open API specif specifications, business documentation, and it gives us an API sandbox where we can try out calls and see sample responses. But even with this, really robust tool, there are some downsides in areas like API discovery. So 
if I don't already know what I'm looking for, there are a lot of integration and API packages on the Business Hub. Um, now, we provide a similar capability to our BTP customers via the integration suite's Business Hub Enterprise, okay? And Business Hub Enterprise also has a broad set of platform APIs to build on. Um, one other aside, as a developer, you know, I found a gap in meaningful content and learning journeys for combining SAP integration suite with other BTP services to build end-to-end -end use cases. And the mission that Martin and I will share with you in a minute or two is really our team's first efforts to start filling that gap with feedback from our own customer projects and some real life experiences. Excellent. So now that we've established, hopefully, integration and API management are important, I would like to also talk about this use case for just a minute. So the team that Martin, Kai, and I are part of works on customer proof of concepts to show how the BTP can address real business problems. And we ran a project in Q1 of this year where the challenge was about creating a unified API catalog for both internal and external developers. So think in the vein of our API business hub, but with a few unique or distinctive requirements. And these are things like having full control over the user experience and the branding of the catalog, but at the same time benefiting from the robust backend provided by Integration Suite. And for this customer, it became especially important due to a lack or you know, not as many professional UI developers as they wanted to both create and maintain a fully customized experience. And this is where SAP's low-code solutions turned out to be an excellent fit. Now, a customer also wanted to make this portal available to guest users, so let's say unauthenticated or guest users, but with a governed path to onboarding and requesting access to individual APIs. And they also wanted it to be a one-stop shop for things like Swagger and open API documentation, regardless of whether the API is managed by SAP or by a third party. Um, this is something that we like to call federation of API gateways. And they also wanted the ability to monetize and bill um, based on rate plans with their payment provider of choice. So through this and some other customer discussions, we realized that these requirements apply to a lot of customers. And we saw kind of a unique showcase opportunity for BTP extensibility of BTP products, which means it can be loosely coupled to various backends, right? So think SAP line of business applications, but without that being a barrier to entry for developers who are actually running the mission. I had the same problem moving from this slide yesterday. So I'm now really happy to share the mission with you. I've put um, a lot of blood, sweat and tears into it. And it's a pleasure to be able to offer it to you completely on the SAP BTP free tier. And what that means is you can run and deploy the entire mission scope in your own BT sub account for free, right? So um, just in the last few years, internally, we got rid of a lot of the internal cross-charging that used to, let's say, inhibit us from working with the platform. Um, and by virtue of that, we get this immense hands-on experience because, well, we can work with literally any service or product on the BTP. And it's great for us to be able to extend some of the same flexibility to the SAP ecosystem in the form of these free tier service plans. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that there are some limitations. So Martin will probably tell you that the integration suite has something like a 90 day limitation before your tenant is discarded. Um, but in the end, the important thing is that you can take all of the artifacts developed in this mission with you hopefully to help you with adoption and creation of your own use cases in the future. Um, and just as the last point before I move to the Discovery Center, 
I also intend to enhance this mission with an API Federation scope item. Um, once this session is out of the way, I'm pretty stoked to be able to dedicate a few cycles of my time to implementing that during the rest of the year. Okay, so this is a good time for us to jump over to the Discovery Center, um, where I'm sure most of you have been before. Um, typical components like the position and challenge that this mission or use case is intended to solve, as well as some detailed architecture diagrams. So here you can see the overall architecture encompassing AppGyver process automation and the integration suite. And you can also get a double click into architecture diagrams for the API monetization with Stripe scope, for example. Um, but speaking of the architecture, um, you will be able to utilize these free tier plans today for the integration suite, for process automation, for the Kima runtime. And I'm real optimistic that in Q4, we'll also get a free tier plan for AppGyver. Um, in the meantime, I'll reassure you that I've run the entire mission scope out of the free community edition, and it works there just fine as well. So um, let's take a look at the project board. Um, it's up to me to take you through the first three lanes, and then I will hand over to Martin for the second part, as I described. Um, and we start here in the Discovery Center, really giving you a chance to learn about a lot of the products and capabilities. Should have known that my session would <laughs> expire. And maybe I take this opportunity to refresh my other browser windows in the meantime. All right, so here in the project board, um, we do give you the ability to learn a lot about the products you'll be using. So for example, with the SAP integration suite, some YouTube videos, links to help files and so on. But really the, let's say the, the meat or maybe the protein for any vegetarians of the mission really starts in the setup phase um, where you'll have an opportunity to learn about the prerequisites and the entitlements that you need in your sub account. And if desired to run boosters right now, boosters are automations that allow you to enable services, assign roles to your user and really to bootstrap um, and accelerate your development in the BTP. So for example, by running this booster for process automation, I can then automatically configure the process automation SaaS application, the process automation services, and assign to myself the process automation admin role so that I should just be able to access the process automation lobby and start with my development. And we try to use these boosters wherever possible. Okay. So um, once you've gone through the prerequisites and you've set up your service instances and your service keys, you're really ready to jump in and work with the products and services that are part of the mission scope. So um, as a first step, and um, actually let me give you one other indicator. So we've stored all of the source code and let's say other file artifacts in a GitHub repository where you can clone them and use them in your own environment. Now, here I am in SAP API management. Um, you see that I have some APIs already deployed in my environment, and I have some metrics. Um, you can see that in the last month, I have you know, called something like 22,000 API calls as I developed this mission and prepared to release it. Probably you won't generate quite as much volume. Um, but one of the first steps that you'll undertake in the mission scope is importing this anonymous API proxy that uses a read-only service key, and it gets you into the platform APIs for the API portal and the Business Hub Enterprise. Um, this is the same API that you could download from the API Business Hub, but I've incorporated or merged a couple of entities to make the ease of access a little bit easier, right? So here you can see resources for API applications, products, which are a collection of APIs, and then the underlying proxies of which this is one, right? So a couple of other highlights from the API proxy point of view. 
You will also implement what we call policies. And these allow you to, uh, let's say, implement concepts such as basic authentication um, on the front end of the API to protect it from unauthorized access, the ability to verify an API key um, that you get from an application, and then to do things like rewrite URLs in some situations using JavaScript to handle some more complex backend functionality, and ultimately to handle the OAuth token flow of your service instance, right? So this policy, for example, will take in a client ID in secret for your technical user, exchange them for a token that represents the API access user, and then provide you with access to the underlying platform. And I'll show you what that looks like right now. So now I have configured the API proxies, I've updated the policies, I've deployed them, and I've added them to one or more API product. So now from a simple API client like Postman, I can send a request to that API proxy and I get back a set of API products in this case, right? So make note of the title, administration APIs or admin product, um, new product and so on, right? And similarly, if I send a request to the same service endpoint, but to the API proxies API, I then get the details of those proxies that are inside the products. Here you can see the dev portal anonymous that I showed you just a moment or two ago. So if we can get this off of my screen. All right. So um, giving you a brief snapshot of the API Business Hub Enterprise, you can see those same products, you can see the date on which they were published, and you can see the count of APIs inside of them. Now, the reason I show you this is we'll now jump over to the subsequent items in this part of the mission scope, right? So this is actually building a low-code app, creating a process automation, and then integrating the two. And I'll wrap up here in a few moments with an end-to-end -end flow. So the rest of my demo will start from the low-code application development lobby. You can see here that I have both AppGyver projects as well as business processes. And I get access to other components like the store where I can download pre-built bots and the monitor area where I can actually look at workflows that are running. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But now I'd like to switch over to AppGyver and show you the results of the four page application that you'll build in um, these mission cards, right? And this is really a step-by-step -step tutorial that takes you through the process of creating SAP-based integrations that are accessed through the BTP's destination service. You can see the three entities that we just talked about a minute ago, but also some AppGyver classic data entities, right? To do things like provide access to a REST API to initiate a developer onboarding process, but also to install these data entities that are kind of pre-built from the AppGyver marketplace that allow us to do things like retrieve a list of countries um, and the two-digit alpha country code to use as part of that onboarding process that I'll show you in just a moment. But from the AppGyver point of view, as I mentioned, you, you will design four pages. Um, I'll give you some highlights from the first page that you build, which I'm just calling the home page. So this will show you how to do things like add a basic card list component, bind it to one of the entities that we're accessing via destination, and to populate the data with some formulas, right? So they could be as simple as looking up a named property from the source record or as complicated as a formula to take let's say an odata uh, formatted date and change it into something that's human readable you'll also instrument some logic right so appgyver has a visual logic modeler that allows you to do things like 
open a page and pass a parameter when one of these rows is clicked in the application. And also to set a, let's say, complicated app variable, right? So in this case, I have an app variable called API list. It is an array and it is comprised of two name properties, the ID and the title, right? So as you go through this mission and this part of the mission, you will actually create this application and wire the pages together to pass some context. So it's probably about time to do the end-to-end -end demo. Um, before I do, I wanna just give you a quick look at the API request form that you'll also construct, right? And this is going to be really the final step in the low-code dev portal where you have browsed the API products, you've identified some proxies that are interesting to you, and you wanna move from this lightweight, lightweight low-code um, perspective into the full featured business hub enterprise. This is where you'll populate a number of these values from dropdown lists to collect the name, the email address, so on and so forth. And you will then pass that via REST API call into the process automation API to kick off the process. Right, so just make a quick mental note of these named properties. All right, so um, now we will launch the AppGyver preview portal and initiate our dev portal app. And let's see if this runs as well as it did last night. So here you have a similar view to the Business Hub Enterprise screen I showed you. You have the title and IDs of each of the API products. You have their human readable publish date. And if I select one of these products, I can then browse the documentation. Let's say, for example, by clicking on guest access for developer portal. And this gives me a very simple Swagger UI Express application that I've deployed on Kima as an optional scope item, where you can also browse the documentation. For example, you can see the OData date format in kind of its true sense that we had to manipulate. Excellent. So now I've looked at this new product, I've determined this is relevant in my developer context, and I want to request access to the API. So I'll quickly full, fill out this form, and I will use one of my throwaway emails for the demonstration. I will request access to this new product, but you can see that the dropdown list is populated with all of those API products. And similarly, because I'm now doing the uh, Europe and East Coast um, version of this garage session, why don't we say I'm from lovely Argentina? So I will now submit this request and drum roll, seems to have worked. We get a message toast saying that the request was submitted successfully. So now if I go to the monitor section of my process automation and application development lobby, I should be able to find this process. It should have been invoked by an API call and it should be ready for me to either approve or reject using my SAP email, which is an administrator here. And in the meantime, while my monitor section comes up, let's also refresh the inbox and see if we have an item here. Okay, we do. The request form came in, right? So at this point, I can say test user access approved. I will select one of the roles from the drop down list. For the mission scope, we only put application developer but you could imagine this would have administrator and maybe any other custom roles you've implemented in your environment. So we'll go ahead and approve this. It says the task has been processed successfully. Seems like it didn't buy us enough time to get the monitor working. So instead, let me just open the process itself and I'll give you a couple of highlights. In the meantime, we will hopefully have that user onboarded automatically in the background. So this is the process automation design canvas. You'll be able to implement or import this very simplified process via an MTAR file that's on the GitHub. But what I wanna highlight for you is the fact that we have an API trigger here 
So the process itself has some inputs and these match the inputs that I showed you on the AppGyver side, right? So when we call this workflow instance to initiate it, we need to make sure that the requested API product, the country, the email ID, and so on are all passed as part of that start event. And if they are, it allows us to dynamically populate that developer email address. You saw my Yahoo mail in the form, pre-populate the API product that was requested, and then provide some simple user input and a dropdown to complete the API call. Excellent. So I did really want to show the monitor. I will try to refresh this one more time. And in the meantime, I will go over to the Business Hub Enterprise and we can take a look at my users. Now, if the process worked as expected, I should have a new registered user. You can see my Yahoo email. It says I'm from Australia, which is interesting. That's what I selected last night. I may have just forgotten to delete this user. But let's double check in the Yahoo mailbox to see if I've also gotten an email indicating that I have been assigned um, some permissions. Great. We will double check one last time. Looks like I'm still having a few issues with my monitor. So I will go ahead and try to resolve those in the meantime. But I think this is a good opportunity for me to complete the low code part of the demo and hand over to Martin. Martin, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you see me? Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Jim, for the nice handover. Um, it's great to see almost 100 people in the call now. And um, yeah, Jim showed us now how to onboard a new developer into the um, Business Hub Enterprise system. And, and trust me, it, it worked this morning. So um, probably it's because of the fact that you, you didn't delete the user and you can't create a user twice in the system. So um, what I'm going to do now is how can we go on and use that API and the users and make sure that we can also monitor our APIs. So charge our developers or users for using the APIs. Um, let me share my screen and give you some introductions before we dive into the details. So I'll share my screen. I hope you can see it. Okay, so I'm jumping in for Kai, who did the morning session, and I'm going to do the afternoon session as the sun is almost setting here in Munich while it's rising in Denver. Um, but let's have a brief look. So where do we come from? Um, what's the reason for that API monetization and, and what, what role is Stripe playing in that game? So we as SAP, I'd say we're pretty good in providing customer software to build their own API solutions as we've just seen in, in Jim sample. Um, we, we provide uh, features for tracking usage by developers or users. And we've got some agnostic monetization features. Like we can track how often an API was called. We can create so-called rate plans to say, okay, when a user hits a product or calls an API of a certain product, um, we will charge him, I don't know, 50 cents or whatever. Um, so this is pretty good, but I'd say it's rather lightweight and agnostic. And we have no features included in API management that allow us to process that information, maybe create an invoice or finish up the payment or really charge the user for using the APIs. And um, lucky us, some month ago, we had a conversation with Stripe, our partner, think about what kind of use cases could we build together. And we said, okay, why don't we use that kind of use case to build an end-to-end -end monetization flow where we take the information that API management provides us, like how many times a user called an API and what we want to charge him for that, and then really create the invoice and, and handle the payment and really make sure the user pays for that usage on the, um, on the APIs he used. And um, yes, yeah, Stripe is the perfect partner, I would say, for that kind of um, POC that we built. Um, they offer a really very popular global payments, uh, payment processing platform with a lot of APIs. So they can't just do invoicing, but a lot of more features. So we just use the invoicing feature to create invoices and send them out to users. Um, but their APIs and the SDK they offer, they, it, it's like huge. Yeah? Um, but for that scenario, we, we decided, yeah, let's build an easy end-to-end -end, uh, flow um, in which we really make sure that we take the bill information or consumption or tracking, usage tracking information from API management, send it to Stripe, and then actually build a user and, and send him an invoice for that. Um, so we came up with an invoicing service. We called it on the Kima runtime. 
So um, let me take a question first, like why did we go for the chemo runtime here? So there's no obvious or special reason why we went for chemo here. So maybe because um, other parts of the solution already use chemo or because CAP uh, now officially also supports the chemo runtime. We just say, okay, let, let's try it on chemo, why not? Um, so we build a future-proof um, solution in chemo, which is using CAP um, as kind of API and a service layer here. And um, yeah, lucky us, we could also use some chemo native features like cron jobs, um, still integrating with the BTP features that we needed like destination service and other stuff. Um, good news for all Cloud Foundry fans out there. Um, the approach we did also be portable to chemo as it's just a plain cap application. Actually, maybe you would need to replace the cron job by, uh, I don't know, a job scheduler. Um, but in, in theory, you should be able to port it. But let's assume you haven't used Kima yet and, and you just want to try it. Um, or you have a Kima cluster in your uh, BTP server account, then yeah, go ahead. Um, or in a trial environment, you can just create a free cluster and try it out, get your first touch points to Kima and um, yeah, deploy the solution to Kima. We'll see in a minute how that works. Uh, another good thing is uh, this is quite a flexible foundation. So you can set up on it if you want to enhance it. For example, if you want to include persistency, that should also work in Kima and a HANA database or if okay, we already judged that user or not, and whatever you want to store there. Um, or you can, I don't know, transform the solution in a lightweight Kima function, um, making it a serverless solution because the current one is an easy sample. It's running 24 seven as an application. Kima is a pot consuming memory. So we could also transform it in the Kima uh, function approach but we haven't done that yet, but we are looking forward maybe to a pull request from your side that would allow to do that and run the stuff as a Kima function. So um, yeah, a, a nice and easy sample to see how Kima works, how we can integrate with BTP and how to integrate also partner solutions like Stripe in your case. Let's have a brief look at the architecture, like how do we create invoices for API usage? Um, I don't wanna focus on the left part, like end users calling the API, Jim has, um, done it in, in great detail, it's pretty good. So I wanna focus on the, uh, on the Kima runtime here on our BTP invoicing solution that we built. Um, so let's go through the steps. So the first step is a cron job, as I said, we've got in Kima and that's running like once per month. Um, this also ensures that we don't double uh, invoice any customer or any developer or any user of the API. But this cron job calls an endpoint uh, or an OData action of, um, of a CAP service that's also deployed in Kima, which is then responsible for doing the actual deployment, uh, not the deployment, the, the invoicing. So um, what does that service do? That service connects to a destination, which we defined in the BTP sub account, and that destination goes to um, the API management instance, which contains all the information that we need to invoice our developers or API users. Um, so it returns us the, um, I don't know, the um, amount that we, we want to charge to the user how many times he called a certain product and so on and so forth. Um, and what we can do then is we can uh, send that information or use it and send it to Stripe. So first thing we need to do on the Stripe side is we need to create a new customer. So we can't create invoices without, without having a concrete customer. In our simple case, we just use the email address of the developer. And if it's already there, even better. If not, we create it on the Stripe side. And um, yeah, once created, we can send an invoice to the customer, taking the information we get from API management, which is really cool. Uh, before I jump into the demo and to the quick look into the code, just an information which is interesting for the community and for you outside, like you can try that sample for free. So all components you need for that sample here and for that mission are free. The Kima runtime is free for 14 days. The integration suite, you can use it for 90 days for free. Um, you can even reset it um, and then uh, create a new instance of both like Kima and integration suite once your trial has expired. Stripe is for free and all the development tools we use are also available for free. So Go ahead and try if you like it. Uh, yeah, no, we're not gonna look into the sample. We're just gonna have a brief look into the code first. So let me share the code. You probably don't see anything currently. So I'll share again. Just a brief look that you see how easy it is and what's happening here. So I, just give me a hint if you see the Visual Studio code. Anyone sees the Visual Studio code? Yeah. Yeah, yep. awesome, okay. So if you clone um, the GitHub, um, and you switch to Stripe branch, then this is what you see. 
So as I said, we've got an invoicing service and we've got a cron job, but let's start with this invoicing service. So pretty easy, pretty simple. So um, the ones of you who have worked with Cup before, they might know this SRV here. Um, that's the service folder. And in here, we've got our Cup service. So that's why I said it should also be portable to Cloud Foundry, if you like that. And uh, actually, this is pretty simple. I said, what do we have here? We have one endpoint in that cup service, which is called by the cron job once per month. And um, we can pass in a month and a year. And um, yeah, that action is obviously there um, to create the Stripe invoices. And uh, this is a TypeScript project. So we go into a TypeScript file here. Um, so what's in there? It's just one implementation of this action here. And this is like a really, really simple and really easy to understand. So there's a few comments in there for you so that you can see how it works and what's happening, but obviously it's very self-explanatory. So as I said, uh, what we do first is we get the chargeable bills using a destination. So it's a little bit outsourced in some further files here. Um, we have a bill service and then the actual Stripe service, we call it, that's then going to Stripe. But first of all, we get the, the bills from API management for that month we request it. And um, in the next step, we, yeah, we loop through the bills and then check, is there already a customer for that bill? Yes or no. And if not, we create one. And um, yeah, the last step, then we just send out the um, bill to Stripe or the, the bill information to Stripe and an invoice will be created and sent to the users. So pretty simple. Um, if we jump into the Stripe service here, for example, we will see um, that we used, oops, where is it? Stripe bill service, Stripe service. Um, you can see that we, for example, use the Stripe SDK up here. So we import it from here and all that stuff here is yeah, like using the, the Stripe um, API, um, which is pretty well documented. It's pretty easy to use, a really good product, I would say. Um, and you can see, we, we just put in here our invoicing items. We, we put in the minimal information that we need to create invoices on the Stripe side. And then we just can send it out, um, put in some metadata, which we need um, to not double create any um, invoices on the Stripe side, but it's not a lot of code. So this is obviously the, the thing I wanna show you. So it's not complicated, it's really easy. Maybe, I don't know, 200 lines of code with some comments and, and, and stuff in between. So a really easy approach. It's easy to understand and really easy to uh, enhance um, depending on your needs. But uh, let's just see it in action. So um, how does it all look in the system? Uh, I pre-recorded a demo just to make sure it all works and I speed up some parts of the deployment because it takes so long on my Windows device. Um, but let's start where Jim actually stopped in his demo. So let's assume um, in API management, we created a product. In my case, it's called Shopping Fresh. Uh, here you see it. And that product contains one API proxy, um, which is, I think, business partner, exactly. And what we did now, we attached a so-called rate plan. We're still seeing VS Code. Is oh, that okay. intended? Yeah, no, that's not intended. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, new share, PowerPoint select. Now you see the PowerPoint again? See the PowerPoint, correct. <laughs> Great, thanks. So, what? Too fast. So let's go a little step in here. So I said, we've got a product in API management, which we created an API product with one API uh, proxy assigned to it, the business partner. And um, what we need to do now to monetize that product is to assign a so-called rate plan. And we see here for that product, the, the silver rate plan, we call it silver plan uh, was assigned, but what is that rate plan now? So if we switch to the monetizing section of the API portal or here in API management, we can see rate plans. And we created one rate plan and that rate plan now defines how we wanna charge um, an, a developer who uses a product, uh, which such a rate plan is assigned to. And we were here in this case, we, we say, okay, this is a rate plan, which we wanna have a monthly, um, oops, oh, this is not the best. So, which we have, wanna have a monthly 
um, payment or a monthly tracking uh, of the user. And we say, okay, whenever um, this rate plan is assigned to a product, uh, to an API product and the user makes use of it, we want to charge a base fee of 10 euros. And for each API call, we want to charge an additional 50 cents. So it's pretty expensive API, but it's just a sample. Again, we can see it's associated to that one API product team. I need to make sure I'm not hitting any keys on the keyboard. <laughs> Um, exactly. Currently, it's only possible to use Euro here, so we would need, probably need to do some currency conversion in, in Stripe, which is possible. Um, I'm not even sure why, why it's only possible to select Europe here, but, uh, Euro here, but um, yeah, shouldn't matter for the use case. So, okay, this is the rate plan. And um, what we do now is we switch to the um, API Business Enterprise, um, where we registered our developers. And in here, we see we also got that API product, Shopping Fresh, uh, which is right there. And um, my user, Martin, is a registered developer and created an application in the um, Business of Enterprise, which is exactly using that product. I called it the application, I called it Store Silver. And if we check that Store Silver application, uh, what we can see is it's assigned or it's making use of that API product, which got a silver plan assigned. And that application, which I created as smart frick, um, I don't know, um, was used like one once this this month. Yeah, so I used the API once this month, and it's making use of that product. Um, so let's see um, what we can see uh, on the API management side, because besides the rate plan, the API management also has this build section here. And what we can see here, I recorded stuff in September is. Oh, there is some bill information for Martin, uh, which is 10 euro 50. And that's exactly the amount which is caused by, yeah, using this API product once and um, one additional call as we've just seen. So that, that's correct. Um, but let's see uh, this stuff works here. We can even see, okay, it was used by the store silver application, which I created in Business Hub Enterprise. Pretty nice. Just to prove that it works, let's do another call. Um, using the API key of that product. We see it again here on the right side. So we're using the API key of that Silver Store application, which was created by myself, so developer Mom Frick. And we do, okay, let's try to find it again. Yeah, oh, we're pretty close here. And we do another call using this API key. We get a result from the backend and checking the bills again. Now we see 11 euros. So it were, it's an additional call, like 10 euros base fee, two times 50 cents for each call, makes it 11 euros. Great. So we've got the bill information on the um, API management side, which we can now use to create an invoice for the, uh, for the developer. Okay, so how can you get the invoicing service deployed to your environment? Just to show you that it's pretty simple process. It's just a few clicks and commands once you've got all the stuff installed probably on your device. First of all, we create a new namespace for our purpose. Uh, we, we recommend you to do so. That makes the deployment simpler and we, we call it trial in uh, our scenario. So pretty simple. In the Kima cluster, we create a new namespace. And then uh, in the Visual Studio Code, we also make sure using kubectl cluster info that we are also connected to that namespace when executing any command in the kubectl. So just comparing the, um, the ID once again of the, of the Kima cluster. Exactly, so that fits. So we are connected to the right Kima cluster. And once we're there, we can also create one thing that's necessary on the Kima side. This is a secret uh, for the Stripe usage because we want to use the Stripe APIs. We need to provide uh, the correct secret, which we can find in the Stripe developer um, settings in our Stripe account. Set that's all for free for testing purposes. Um, so I'll just put in some random numbers here and some dots, I guess. But Actually, you would do this and put in your Stripe um, API key in here, which makes sure that you can connect to the Stripe API, and then we can go on with the deployment of the application. So next step, let's see what's coming. Um, 
yeah, you will need to update and make sure that some information in the, for example, here in the network policy matches your um, schema namespace. If you use trial, you should be pretty, yeah, good to go. Um, in the values file, uh, in the values YAML, you will need to update the repository name to your Docker Hub account so that Kima can pull the correct image and maybe provide a, uh, a pull secret if required, if you've got a private Docker Hub account. So then we do an NPM install. It's just time slaps here. So because it takes some time on Windows, I, I could do it in live this morning because on the Mac it seems to be much faster. But once we did installed our dependencies, we come to the interesting part. So actually what you can do is you can deploy on this whole solution with one simple npm command which combines multiple other npm commands which we can find at package JSON here um, so we're using the pack tool which is also described in the uh, documentation and in the mission um, to create a, a docker uh, image and to push it up to um, docker hub and um, we combine like these three commands in the pack the push docker and the deploy to kima command in one um, npm command in here, which makes sure, okay, we build the image, we push it to Docker Hub, and then we deploy it to Kima um, using Helm. So it all works um, on the fly. We just need to pass in uh, two parameters when executing that command, which is the namespace trial in our case, and our uh, image name like Martin Frick slash BTP invoicing so that we know where or from which Docker Hub to pull it from. And then this takes a while. So this is a time slot so again because it's taken, I don't know, on my device, it takes five minutes or longer. Like we see, okay, something here is that um, Pack is, is downloading the required content to build the Docker image. And it takes a few seconds here only on your device. It might take a little bit, little bit longer, but once that's done, uh, we're pushing that Docker image to Docker Hub. That's what's happening now. And uh, once that process is done, also takes, few minutes probably for you. Um, we do a uh, Helm upgrade uh, command. We can see it here. So this is the last command of the process or of the NPM, of the combined NPM command. And what we're doing is we deploy uh, this solution to uh, our Kima environment. And now we can see, okay, it's running and available in the Kima environment. So it's easy as that to deploy this cup service to the Kima environment. So what we see in now, we can see a new Helm release in our Kima cluster, and we see that also a pod is already running. Yeah, which is hosting that um, cup service that we created. Okay, one thing left, the cron job. So I said the cron job is calling our API endpoint once per month. We also provided you a simple command, which you can just run here, providing the namespace to deploy that cron job, which is a native Kima function, and just calls the endpoint once a month using a, a curl um, or a pot using a, a curl image. Um, so really lightweight, that's rather self-explanatory. So that also takes a few seconds and then it's in. So what's left on the BTP side is a destination that we need to fetch our information from the API management, like the bill information, what cost did a developer cost or, um, yeah, what, what what amount needs to be built, and we see that destination is going to the uh, to our API portal endpoint, um, which is coming from the service key which we created here in our sub account. Uh, this service is called API portal API access, and this allows us to retrieve, for example, bill information from API management. So pretty simple, all explained in the um, documentation. Okay, so let's test this stuff. Um, we provided you a guide or an idea how to test that stuff. Um, so what we actually do is we fake what the cron job is doing. Uh, we are running a curl command ourselves in a um, curl pod that we spin up in the same uh, Kima namespace, um, which is happening here. Uh, it's all described in the documentation set how to do that. And once we are in that curl, uh, we can just run the following command. Probably you would use uh, October now, but as you can see, this is doing nothing else than calling the Stripe endpoint or this endpoint, which our invoicing service provides in the correct namespace uh, with some um, yeah, body here. Um, I don't know, with the, the month and the year we want to test and create invoices for. And 
yeah, calling this action, we will see after a few seconds if it worked or not. And if it worked out, you will see a success method. Yeah, one invoice has been successfully sent to the customer and checking um, Stripe now. What we can see is my user, Martin, uh, has been built 11 euros. We see down here, I did the recording on uh, September 28th. I've been built 11 euros for calling the API um, Shopping Fresh or the API product Shopping Fresh with my Silver Store application two times. Um, I mean, this is probably not a legal binding invoice because we're missing taxes and stuff. Um, you would probably need to add that on your side, but what you can do is you can download the invoice and check it even as a PDF or then in a productive uh, Stripe account, send it out to the customer. Yeah, that's it from my side. Um, how you can do monetization of the APIs uh, created in uh, API Business Hub Enterprise in a very simple and lightweight approach, which is completely free as set for you as a developer to start off. And um, yeah, I would say it's pretty easy. You've seen it, it's just a few commands you need to execute to have the correct for sure, development tools ready like Docker and, and Helm and, and kubectl, but then you're yeah, pretty much set to go. Um, all stuff is free, try it out. Super cool use case integrating um, with our partner uh, solution Stripe here. So I would say, Jim, shall I go back to the last slide or do you want to share? No, um, feel free to take us home, Martin. Cheers. Awesome. Yeah. Sharing it. Well. No, that's not what I wanted to see. I've already seen that. What the heck? There we go. I was already open. I thought I'm in Stripe, but I was. I was no worries. <laughs> no worries. And I, I guess that just about wraps up the content. So yeah. um, you can reach out to us in the context of the mission. Uh, we are offering this with full coaching. Um, I'll try to take most of that onus, Martin and Kai, so that you're not getting bugged all the time, but here's our contact information. We'd love to hear from you if this is somehow viable in your context. Um, I'll also close the loop I put into the chat. It was me being too tired last night to offboard my user. So once I rectified that, process ran successfully and I was able to see the output. Awesome. So I think we have a few minutes left, Tauros. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Maybe we could open up for any other questions. I think we okay. got all the ones in the chat. Okay. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, so if you guys have any questions for either Martin or Jim, uh, please do either unmute your line or type your question in the chat. And uh, we'll get to your questions as quickly as possible. Are there any questions? Have we overlooked any questions that you may have typed in the chat? Just taking a quick peek. I think we got them all. Okay. Yep. Well, uh, okay, guys. Awesome. Seems like uh, everybody's questions have been answered. Yeah, if not, they've uh, got our mail. <laughs> oh, here we go. Uh, For API management, do we need to onboard external users? Yeah, so Prakash, the answer to that is if you want to charge them, then for sure you would need to onboard the users. Um, what we tried to show is that you could certainly do that manually through API portal, through your SAP cloud identity um, service. But we also provide the APIs, right, to do that either via a digital process or through some other procedure. Um, the last comment I'll make there is that API management does support this concept of like dynamic roles and groups. So it could be possible to onboard in kind of a soft sense a whole bunch of users, right, via, let's say, a group that you federate from some other corporate identity provider, right? Um, and then activate those users on demand when they actually utilize the developer portal. Okay. Ah, so Guy also has an interesting question about yeah. safeguarding from maximum amounts. Um, something we didn't cover, Guy, but is available out of the box on these API products are things like rate limiting, right? So. Um, only allowing a certain number of calls in a certain period of time, 
Um, and furthermore, you can add, let's say, like denial of service protection and other policies that API management provides out of the box. So in a productive sense, I would say these API products would be locked down to prevent really astronomical usage, except maybe on a case by case basis. And then you would also apply some security policies to make sure that the endpoints aren't abused. I think between those policies and the rate limiting, you should be able to take care of that. Not sure, Martin, if you had anything. Uh, yeah, to add I'm, to that I'm also one. I'm also pretty sure that Stripe has some features on their side to prevent like astronomical invoices or uh, I don't know the outliers or to identify stuff like that. But but furthermore, like this API call to 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 create the invoices actually is only available like in internal in the key environment. It's not published to the outside. Like no one no one could you, contact or call that API endpoint from the public internet. So it's only callable from within the schema uh, cluster. Given, got it, given the invoicing service is running on a private route is, is your point yeah. that you could not call it externally. Yeah. That's a good extra safeguard. Um, I also see a question from uh, Puneet here about CSRF tokens. So Martin, you might also have something to add to this, but I believe our frameworks like CAP and the Cloud SDK do some of that CSRF token handling automatically. Um, and if you're using pure Java or JavaScript, then you need to handle those complexities yourself. Am I okay with that answer? Do you wanna add anything there? No, I did just said I, I had the same topic this morning in a customer call, like CSRF protection. I mean, there's a lot of information on it also from the CUP, CUP side. So if you're using CUP, check out the CUP documentation, search for CSRF and you will find content on information on that. Um, but as Jim said, I assume they're doing it out of the box. I hope so. <laughs> well, I can tell you, no. having worked now with the cloud SDK, it does handle the CSRF stuff for you automatically. But if you're doing like more or less a naked HTTP call, you have to make those follow-up calls yourself. It's just the reality. And hopefully yeah. a value add for using one of the SAP opinionated frameworks. No, that's true. That's true. That's what I figure it out that while if I call via BTP internally, then everything works fine. I don't have to make another call, but if I am calling from external from any of the Java application, then definitely, yes, I have to. Okay. That's exactly right. Fine. Thank you. Um, of course. Last question I think I see is from Johan. So um, are there any workflows running with the approval? It's a very simple workflow, Johan. Effectively it is initiate the process trigger the approval and based on approval, call the onboarding API. Um, so no like business rules or other complex logic, but hopefully a starting point for you to add richness to the process. And just to, to close the loop on Guy's last comment, yes, um, please also protect your identity providers with two-factor authentication and some of the other goodness that we provide out of the box to prevent someone from just, let's say, stealing Martin's S user ID and going all willy nilly on the invoicing service. Well said. I think for, for Kima, it's even default already. Like it's very <laughs> frustrating. You always have to put in like the mobile code that you can send to your mobile. But I think for Kima Landscape, you, you, you need a good it point. Anyway to a factor. That's a good, good way to close. In Kima 2.0, we have a mandatory identity provider integration and two-factor authentication is enabled out of the box. Well said. Nice. Thanks a lot, Jim and, and Martin. Great, great session. Hopefully everybody's, uh, you've got your, your questions answered or maybe some a few new ones have been pop, popped into your mind. After the session, please do reach out to either Jim or, or Martin uh, or myself, and um, we'll definitely get the, those answers to you. Um, Please join us again next month. Uh, next uh, next month on November the second, our next mission will be develop extensions for SAP S for HANA with SAP BTP in the ABAP environment uh, runtime. So we've got a, a great session lined up for for next month as, as well. Thank you again, everyone, for taking time out of your busy schedules to to join us this month. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to join us next month. Have a great morning, afternoon, or evening wherever you're located. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.